Are we ready? Yep, let's do this. highway bridge and couldn't help but look below you stood on a shoreline's rocky ridge just to watch the water flow and count yourself as one of the few with a different set of dreams the kind that keeps you up at night because you can't wait to get to that stream it's more more than a river Shit in the saddle, the V in the boulders, and the lean in the shoulders. When you reach for the eddy, it doesn't get better than this. Yes, it's more, so much more, more than a river. And all it takes is a little class to still give you. And you live for a breath of the valley air in the mist and the morning hush. When it doesn't matter just where you are as long as the water's white. Some say it's a crazy way to live, but to you it's a way of life. It's more, more than a river. Shift in the saddle, the V in the boulders and the lean in the shoulders. When you reach for the Yeti, it doesn't get better than this. Yes, it's more, so much more, more than a river. The way of a canoe is the way of the wilderness and of a freedom almost forgotten. It is an antidote to insecurity the open door to waterways of ages past, and a way of life with profound and abiding satisfactions. When a man is part of his canoe, he is part of all the canoes have ever known. Lean in the shoulders when you reach for the Yeti, it doesn't get better than this. Yes, it's more, so much more. Oh, yes, it's more, oh, so much more. More than a river More than a river Before modern transportation conveniences like roads, railways, and aircraft, our waterways were the most efficient way of travel, and the most effective means of travel was by the noble canoe. It didn't take long for early European explorers to find this out. Beginning in 1603, that was the year Samuel de Champlain, the father of New France, is establishing a little colony at the mouth of the St. Lawrence. Port Royal, and he's amazed at how the locals with their little bark canoes are just darting zip, zip, zip around their clumsy European boats. And he writes back to France, by adopting the bark canoe of the savage and its network of waterways, we can see everything in two years' time. Well, in 1603, he had no inkling of how massive North America was. 
Recreational canoe camping came into favor during the last half of the 19th century by sportsmen and the growing middle class who were seeking an escape from the thick air and congestion of the cities. After World War II, canoes stamped out of lightweight aluminum hit the market, making it possible for many families to buy an inexpensive and low-maintenance canoe. This opened the door for many exciting and memorable adventures. Wikipedia describes canoe camping as a combination of canoeing and camping. It's similar to backpacking, but canoe campers travel by canoe or kayak. I like to think of it as backpacking on steroids. Not just traveling through the natural world, but living in it and accepting everything it involves. So we know how and when canoe camping became a popular pastime. Now rises the question of why. Why seemingly sane people would thrust themselves into what some might consider an uncivilized, even hostile environment. That's the anticipation of what's around the corner of each bend in the lake. Just, it happens at a rate that, that I enjoy. Uh, it's a uh, stroke and a rest, a stroke and a rest, but um, always pushing on to see what's around the next corner. Basically, I think maybe three things. Freedom, remoteness, and challenge. Uh, freedom to follow your own star as you see fit. And when you are out there, the wilderness takes precedent. You have no time to worry about uh, you know, finances or your work or whatever. You are totally in tune with something unique. Uh, challenge, the challenge of finding portages, running white water, setting up a camp, keeping a camp dry, being in command in the middle of a storm, uh, those to me are, are, are really very, very rewarding things. And uh, remoteness, uh, I mean the first time you stand in the middle of a hundred thousand caribou or, uh, or watch them swim across a river or see a polar bear or a seal, uh, this is not like going to a zoo. Um, it's, it's a remote feeling that you, you, you get, you feel, uh, and you, you, can't, you can't get this, get this anyplace else. So I guess those are really the three reasons why. We've been doing it together for a lot of years. Uh, we've been lots of different states and we've never been to Missouri before. So we tried to do this trip last year and it was flooded out. So we were looking forward to this for about 14 months. It's a beautiful area. Better. We're not really on vacation yet because it's Sunday, so tomorrow really our, is our first vacation day, so <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. <laughs> I love canoe camping just because it allows you to get out uh, where you normally can't go. Um, it gives you the chance to have relationships and develop those relationships and, you know, the, sort of the triangle of, you know, you, friends, and nature is, you know, it's really interesting how much you can develop a relationship over a short period of time uh, traveling with someone. I really like the uh, the self-contained aspect of it. You know, it's not like backpacking where you're self-contained, but it's like you saw the handle off your toothbrush and you know measure your food out with a teaspoon to make sure you don't carry too much weight. You can kind of take whatever you want, but it's in this little spot, this little contained thing. And you think about it, if you're out, you know, on a solo trip especially, everything you need in the world is right there, and it sort of strips away all the superfluous, superfluous stuff. Superfluous. Superfluous. Real uh, camping where you can relate to our forefathers and their primitive style of traveling, but to get back <coughs> to the simple life. That's part of the discovery that you make with an experience like that. It takes your mind into a different place. I think that's what that's what wilderness means to me. It takes your mind and puts you into the present. You become adapted to doing only what you need to do at the moment and not thinking about what you have to do tomorrow, what appointments you have the next day. And I mean, it's, uh, it's bringing you back into the now. And uh, you know, it's picking up that canoe and walking the portage and keeping your eyes on the rocks and not tripping and, and getting everything back into the canoe and paddling across a beautiful lake yeah. into a sunset maybe. There's a very spiritual component to it. It's not necessarily religious, but, you know, for me it is. But, but uh, you know, you think about all the great religious traditions of the world, nobody went inside to get inspired. You know, Moses went up the mountain and Jesus went to the wilderness and Mohammed went to a cave in the desert and Buddha sat under a tree and um, no one ever goes inside. 
for spiritual enlightenment. They always go out. Canoe camping can be enjoyed virtually anywhere there's water, the best places being where only a canoe can take you. On pristine lakes, along the seashore, down twisting rivers, wherever your desire and thirst for adventure takes you. Primitive shoreline camping is not legal everywhere, however. Before venturing out, it's always recommended that you first check with state and local agencies for more information about where it's allowed and if there are any special rules in place. Lake travel, like what's found in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness in northern Minnesota, generally consists of various sized lakes interconnected by trails called portages. Like no two lakes are the same, neither are the portages between them. They can be as short as a few yards or as long as a few miles. Many popular routes can be found that have relatively short portages, though. Along rivers with rapids, dams, and waterfalls, portages are also necessary for safe travel. Portaging is whatever you make of it. You can consider it torturous, or you can view it as an opportunity to stretch your legs and enjoy the surrounding landscape. Just something you do to get from one lake to the other. I don't know why people make such a big deal over it. Portaging is just pick up your stuff and go. It's one of those things you have to do to get to the next lake. and It's all psychological. The typical portage is you go up, and you go down, and at the bottom of your down is where the lake is, but those ones that cheat you and you see a glimmer of water because of a stream or something, and then you go back up, everyone's attitudes just plummet. And that's discouraging for a lot of people. And it can be sometimes for me when they're particularly long and hilly. But uh, you just rise to, rise to it and go to the other side. You, that's what it takes to get there. Portaging is something that goes with the game. I mean, if you're going to canoe uh, in a wilderness area, you're going to have to carry your canoe from watershed to watershed or around rapids or, or whatever the case might be. Um, sometimes it's enjoyable when you've been in a canoe all day long, you get out and you can portage. Uh, the key is to not carry so much that it becomes a drudgery. Uh, I think be willing to make more trips and uh, be sure everything is packed and packed so you don't have a bunch of loose items. If you're just starting out, we recommend that you pick a destination that fits your individual skills and experience level. You'll want your first time to go smoothly, as well as being a safe one. Most mistakes and bad conditions can be avoided by a careful preparation and planning. To get started canoe camping, you don't necessarily need anything. There are outfitters on many popular canoe waterways that can provide you with everything you'll need. Canoes, camping gear, even a car shuttle. I guess I should explain what a car shuttle is. It's needed when you're paddling a river where you'll be ending your trip downstream from where you start. Or when paddling a chain of lakes and not making a loop trip. You'll either need someone to pick you up at the end and drive you back to your car, or have your car waiting for you at the end. Outfitters can help you with that. We do canoe, kayak, and raft rentals here on the river. We do guided fly fishing. I use a wooden McKenzie drift boat for that. And um, we also shuttle vehicles and things like that. And we have cottage rentals. If you're wanting to own your own gear, let's go over the basics. It's important to do some research on products and be honest with your needs. Decide if this is going to be a once a year thing where you may want to just rent a canoe and some of your gear, or if you're ready to make that commitment to throw down some cash and buy your own. What type and how much gear you pack is largely personal preference. There are some who bring along everything, including the kitchen sink. You want some? Others prefer to bring along only the bare minimum for survival. Either way, or anything in between, the choice is entirely up to you. It's true that canoe campers have the luxury to carry more gear than backpackers can, but there are still limitations. Canoes can only carry so much weight before they become sluggish and difficult to maneuver. They can also become dangerously close to taking water over their sides. Difficult or long portages may also limit how much gear you bring along. 
Another thing to consider is low impact camping or leave no trace. This is where through basic steps, you leave the spot where you camped and traveled looking like you were never even there. The seven basic principles are, plan ahead and prepare, travel and camp on durable surfaces, dispose of waste properly, leave what you find, minimize campfire impacts, respect wildlife, and be considerate of other visitors. And the first thing that I would say to people is if you really want to get into canoe camping or any kind of camping or whatever it is, start by reading everything in the canoeing literature. When I was a kid, I read every single book that had ever been written on canoeing and camping. Not once, but many times. I could remember and recite passages from them. By doing that, what you do is you set in motion the wheels for understanding what you need and what you don't need. And the truth is, most people spend their money on things they don't need. And if you're going to rent stuff, that's fine. But rent the best. Spend a little bit more money, go with an outfitter that's going to rent you top shelf stuff. Then you'll see, you'll feel in your hands the difference between a $200 carbon fiber paddle uh, and a, a, a $39 aluminum and plastic paddle. Once you discover that, you'll know where to put your money. Skills are more important than things. So if, you, if you, you work on your skills, instead of just buying something to solve the problem, you'll be a lot happier out there. Um, even when bugs are really, really bad, there's ways of dealing with things. And sure, it's, it's not a picnic all the time. Sometimes you have to bite the bullet and things are tough. But if you think in your life of the tough experiences, those are really the things you remember the most. The first thing you'll need is a canoe or kayak. For as many places and types of waterways there are for paddling, there are even more types and styles of canoes and kayaks available. To make some sense of it all, it's best to do some research, then go visit a paddling store for some expert advice. There is no simple definition of a canoe as far as material, design, length, uh, usage, method of propulsion. Man has tried everything. First, decide where you want to canoe, what kind of canoeing you want to do. If it's lake canoeing, you want to buy a lake canoe. If it's river canoeing, you want to buy a river canoe. If you want to do all of the above, you want to paddle rapids, you want to paddle lakes, then you're going to need a more versatile canoe. The, it, the, it's like buying a car. You can't have one car that's going to do everything well. So you first of all have to decide what your main thing is. That's why some people own a pickup truck and a sports car and, and, and whatever, because canoes are just like that. Never listen to advice from your brother-in-law because they'll always tell you that the best canoe is the one they have, and it rarely is. Um, but yeah, find people who know what they're talking about, and uh, you know, find out what kind of water, how big, you know, and what are your personal limitations, both you know, weight-wise, picking it up and carrying it. There's another personal limitation, which is how comfortable you are with things getting beat up, and uh, like fiberglass and Kevlar canoes are really nice. They paddle really nicely, but they're subject to what I call, you know, cosmetic durability problems. They're still durable, but you see a scratch and you kind of cringe a little bit. In that case, you go to a boat, you know, like a Royal X boat where you can beat the snot out of it and not really care that much. So sometimes the best one isn't the one you think it is. Um, ultimately, the best one is the one you use, you know, the one you can get your hands on. And, a lot of people go out in aluminum canoes and have a great time and, you know, are they the most efficient in the world? No. Are they the, you know, the lightest? No. Are they the quietest? No. But better an aluminum, aluminum canoe full of gear than a Kevlar boat with dust on it in someone's garage. Now that you have a boat, next you'll need to learn how to paddle it. Sometimes the store you bought it from can lead you where to learn or they may even offer classes themselves. There's so much to learn that, uh, that you have to start somewhere in a class, beginning class is the place to do that. Uh, people are learning their whole lives how to paddle so uh, you've got to begin in the formal class. Uh, it's hard to learn it on your own. You can't really learn the strokes and everything without having somebody to model and show you how to do it. Um, I've had people try it in books, from books and it just doesn't work. The beginning class would be start with basic safety information, things like wearing your PFD and, uh, and um, weather information, how to uh, avoid uh, dangerous uh, weather and so on. 
uh, and then would get into basic strokes, teach some uh, flat water maneuvers, spins and, and turns and things like that. Uh, just minimal uh, stuff to get you on the water so that you have a chance to learn how to, how to control your boat a little bit and, and learn the basic safety information. The bottom line is, efficient paddle strokes will not only make your canoe or kayak go where you want it to, but they'll also help your arms last much longer. Oh, and be sure to get some practice in first before taking on your first big trip. Ask six people what tent you should buy, and you'll likely get six different answers. A tent has two basic functions, to protect you from bad weather and to keep mosquitoes and other pests from feasting on you while you sleep. Canoeing shelters have come a long way since the days when the voyageurs would sleep under a tarp anchored by their canoe. Canvas tents are making a comeback, but for most of us, a modern nylon tent with aluminum poles makes more sense. They come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Here are a couple of things to look for. A rain fly that covers the entire tent, not just a little spot on top, and plenty of tie downs to anchor it firmly to the ground during high winds. Alternatives to tents are hammocks. All the cool kids are using these. One of your most important pieces of gear is rain gear. After all, you may have to live in it for a day or more. Here, anything will work as long as it keeps you dry and won't rip to shreds the first time it gets snagged on a tree limb. Oh, let's not forget a tarp. A tarp is the most critical thing, I think, when you're camping because it can take you out of the tent when the weather's trashy and get you to be a social creature. You know, we're all social creatures. Diving into the tent, uh, you, you, why go outside to be inside, as Darren Bush has said? Um, it doesn't make sense. Just like tents, sleeping bags also come in a wide variety. There are basically two types of insulating fill material, natural goose down and synthetics. Both have good points and bad. Seek out information on each so you can decide which type will work best for you. They also come in a wide range of temperature ratings, from 30 below zero to warm summer temps. An advantage canoe campers have over backpackers is that we have the luxury of being able to haul bulkier items like thick, comfy sleeping pads. Dibs on this one! Hey, no, no you don't! Get back here! Get back here! Get back here. Another thing to think about... There is nothing <laughs> as comforting on a canoe trip as a little six-inch pillow with a little down in it or that that you can lay under your ears on the side of your face when you sleep at night. You don't need a huge pillow, that little bit which occupies little space in your kit and weighs virtually nothing. Of course you'll need something to carry all your gear in. As you can probably imagine, packs also come in a wide variety of shapes, sizes, and materials. One thing they all have in common is being waterproof in some way. Another thing to consider is a comfortable way of carrying them. Fly on, wave, wave. A backpacker needs just one pack. And if that backpacker spends $400, $500 on a pack, okay, it's a lifetime investment. A canoeist needs three packs minimum, maybe as many as five or six. So if you're going to be spending three or $400 per pack, you better have the money. So I guess what I'm saying is if you do your research, you're going to, decide, you're going to realize that there's no best pack or there's no best item. Diversity often pays big dividends, so you can have a number of different kinds of packs. Unfortunately, we can't fit any of these large packs through the hatch of a kayak. There you'll need various sized, smaller dry bags. Most kayak campers are constantly looking for that perfect combination of size and shape to take advantage of every limited square inch in their craft. And the whole concept about packing a sea kayak is you want to keep as much weight as possible towards the uh, center of the kayak and put the lighter stuff out near the ends for stability. I personally like to keep things off the deck to uh, keep my windage low, exposure to wind low, 
and uh, ready to go. This is my sleeping pad, ultra light and uh, compact. And uh, this is my pillow. Dry bag here, and it's got my, uh, if it's cold weather camping, I've got my coat and my uh, toque, as we say in Canada, and my gloves. And I shove that behind my seat. Just rest on that. Uh, next thing I generally pack is my uh, day hatch. And this is the stuff that goes in my day hatch. And this is my flare box for signaling. And I generally put one or two flares in my uh, PFD as well. <laughs> there we go. These are spare hatch covers. And of course, mosquito repellent, sunscreen. And if you're going into bear country, bear spray. This is my storm keg, also doubles as a raincoat. And it's basically just a, a big keg you put on. It's a full head covering, body covering, and it'll go around the spray deck as well if you're out in stormy weather. So these are my tent poles and tent pegs. And uh, I'm gonna shove them as far up in the bow as possible. You gotta make use of every inch of space that you've got. One little trick that might help you is if you when you put it in, put the drawstring hanging out this way. Sometimes they get stuck up in there. Pull on the drawstring to get it out. Tent that way. Sleeping bag, that's a fairly heavy item even though it's compact. So that can go towards the cockpit. One thing you want to remember if you have a deck compass is you don't want to put anything that's metal anywhere around your deck compass or it could end up going in circles. When it comes to food, I like to take as much fresh as possible. So I've got some uh, fruits and vegetables here and I always use a mesh bag for these because if you put them in a, a bag and close them up, they're going to perish a lot quicker than if you have them exposed like this. The other thing is they're going to be in the back hatch and they're going to be uh, basically uh, in the water. So if the water is cold, it'll help keep them fresh longer. Now my kayak doesn't have a skeg. But if you have a skeg, then you've got a skeg box in there that's going to take up some room. And uh, these items are nice to shove in around the skeg box. And I mark my two main food bags, uh, dinner and uh, breakfast and lunch. And again, dinner is all dehydrated uh, meals and breakfast and lunch is all fresh stuff. Tortilla wraps and cheese and good things like that. Put your duds on, you're ready to go. When most beginner campers think about camp food, the classic beanies and weenies are the first thing that comes to mind. If that's what you like, fine, but if you want better, there are a few options and with a little planning, you can eat just as good or even better than you do at home. First up, fresh foods. Probably the best tasting, but definitely the heaviest, especially if you need to keep it in a cooler. What many seasoned travelers will do is freeze steaks, wrap them in a towel, and just put them in a pack with the rest of their food. By the time camp is raised the first night, the meat is thawed and ready to throw on the grill. Next, dehydrated and freeze-dried. By taking all or most of the moisture out of food, you're making it much lighter, more compact, and able to last for weeks without spoiling. Don't have a dehydrator? Your grocery store has countless products that will foot the bill. And with a little imagination, you can prepare a meal fit for a king. A package of ramen, some shiitake, dried shiitake mushrooms, and dehydrated hamburger. It doesn't have to be dehydrated, you can try it home with fresh. Mix all that together. If you have some uh, dried veggies of any kind, you can, th you can, throw, those, uh, you can throw those in there. Add an extra bouillon cube uh, for every three people. It's, it's it, like everybody's favorite, and it, there's nothing to making it. Another option is prepackaged meals, made especially for canoe campers and backpackers. For some of these, it's as simple as just adding hot water, and voila, you have a hot meal. Others may require a bit more effort, but the results are well worth it. it smells like corn. Well, 
Looks like it says corn on the package. It must be corn. One thing to keep in mind is that you'll be burning a lot of calories during the course of your day. Paddling, portaging, just being outside seems to build up a hearty appetite. Eat well, you deserve it. Well, now that you know what you want to eat, let's look at ways to cook it. Wood fires are romantic and give a fantastic Yay. taste of food, but can be unpredictable for cooking over. A safe bet on getting a hot meal in your belly is by cooking on a camp stove. Lots to choose from here. Most are collapsible and compact. The big difference comes with the type of fuel used. Everything from the classic sterno cans to alcohol, kerosene, butane and propane, and even gasoline. If you think you can't bake while camping, think again. There are very few places on Earth where the water that fills our lakes and rivers doesn't have bacteria, viruses, and parasites like Giardia or beaver fever floating around in it. Before drinking or cooking with it, some type of treatment needs to be employed to remove all this bad stuff that has the potential of making you sick. There are many ways of purification, boiling, iodine tablets, ultraviolet light, and a couple of others. Keep in mind, these methods will only kill the organisms. They won't make the water clearer. To accomplish that, you'll need a filter. These filters all employ some type of cartridge made of ceramic or paper. Some new campers may feel uncomfortable in the woods at night. There are many options here, from tiny headlamps to big lanterns. Keep in mind the time of year. During the summer, especially in the more northern lands, daylight lasts quite late, even later than you may last. As far as clothing goes, stay away from cotton. When it gets wet, it loses all of its insulating properties and takes forever to dry. Stick with fast drying nylon and synthetics or good old fashioned wool. Best practice is to use what dries quickly shields from bugs, poison ivy, stinging nettles, and the sun. And don't forget to bring an extra set. This is a water sport after all. The chances of getting wet are pretty high. Often our camping adventures take us some distance away from timely medical care. The best way to deal with medical emergencies is prevention. Choose a route that you're physically fit to accomplish and be careful. Don't take unnecessary risks. You'll need a well-stocked first aid kit, but no kit will do you any good if you don't know how to use its contents. We highly recommend that you take a first aid class. If planning a true wilderness trip, we recommend that you go a step further and attend a class on wilderness first aid. This will prepare you better for dealing with injury and illness if help is hours or even days away. Also, have an emergency plan in place. Know how and where to get help. Keep in mind, when we get away from roads and civilization, cell phone coverage becomes unreliable. Can you hear me now? Commonly, when we think about first aid, our thoughts go to broken bones, blood spurting cuts, etc. Those are certainly scenarios that we should prepare ourselves for, but the most common illnesses and injuries are ones that could happen at home. For example, sunburn and typical scrapes and cuts that merely need a good cleaning and bandaging. So, does a bear in the woods? Of course, and so do people. is a little talked about issue, but it shouldn't be. As uncomfortable as it may be to discuss, with the growing number of people visiting our wild places, it's important that we do. The particulars on method depend largely on where you are. 
Most popular canoe camping destinations accommodate us with what's called a thunder box. These are strategically placed and maintained by the managing agency. Areas that have especially sensitive ecosystems have a pack it out rule. This is accomplished in a variety of ways. Bag it or by using a portable toilet or groover. A third means of disposal is the most primitive. This is what's called a cat hole. Too shallow and it may be seen, dug up by animals, or worse, stepped in. Too deep and it'll be below the layer of organic material that holds all the good decomposing microorganisms and bugs. Here's one simple solution to the lack of privacy. One of the biggest concerns beginner campers have is encountering bears and other wildlife coming into their campsite. This concern is so great that I'm afraid it keeps many from experiencing canoe camping altogether or at the very least being apprehensive about it. I've never had a bear in camp. Been doing it a long time. Um, I suspect that maybe because I'd, I'd rather canoe, I'd rather paddle than fish so there's quite often not fish deal with fish around and when I prepare the food it's quite simple <laughs> so uh, there's not a lot of food smells but I've never really I have more tr you more have more trouble with the mini bears the little uh, red squirrels and chipmunks they 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 by far take more packs and food than bears will ever take uh, just that bears are a big deal they're big if a bear can't see your food and he can't smell your food he won't get your food we recommend that you familiarize yourself with bear behavior. Then you will likely understand that your fears are largely unfounded. Black bears don't give a hoot about you. They only want your food. To minimize the likelihood of an encounter, a few simple but effective steps should be taken. Keep a clean, odor-free camp. Bears have an excellent sense of smell. Store your food properly, either by hanging it in trees or hiding it away from your camp. And never, ever have food inside your tent. To avoid most of the bugs, know when during the year they are most prolific. Try to make your camp away from bogs and wetlands where mosquitoes are greatest in numbers. When it's impossible to get away from the annoying pests, cover your skin the best you can. Wear long pants and long sleeve shirts. A head net will also help you maintain your sanity. Better yet, one of these bug jackets. Bugs, hey, they're out there. Be prepared for them. Uh, the mosquito repellents are quite well. If not, get a bug shelter if they really bug you. Get out on the water. They're usually not out on the water. Rarely have I seen them on the water. So, uh, and there's usually a couple hours in the evening where they're strong, and then they, they dissip dissipate as the temperatures cool off, and then get out and watch the stars. Okay, bugs. You know, bugs are what they are, and sometimes uh, they are so horrendous that even those of us who uh, can tolerate them have to die for the tent. But there are some things that you can do to minimize it. Number one, heading the list are avoid colors that bugs like. And what they like is navy blue. That's top of the list. Ironically, most of the stuff you buy in outdoor stores is navy blue. It's the most popular color. Don't buy navy blue. Black's not good either. Generally, the lighter colors are better, and it's really quite, quite pronounced. Um, if you're going to use repellents, don't get taken in by clever advertising that's going to tell you how all these natural repellents work. You know what? They don't work. What works is D, diethyl made toluene, and the more of it you have, basically the better it works. There are some exceptions. You can mix it, use cream-based repellents, last longer than alcohol-based repellents, and so forth. But basically, what works is uh, what works is D.
We hope that by watching this video, we helped you to make the decision to join us in exploring our natural world through canoe or kayak camping. But be forewarned, once you begin, you'll likely be hooked for life. I hope the waters you cross are calm and still and take you to where you see and should the wind start to blow just where it will may your paddle be true and deep i hope the skies above you are always blue and your journey will flow downstream should the currents rise up to challenge you, may your paddle be true and deep. And know you have a kindred spirit to guide you on your way. In the silence you can hear it. Just a breath away And when your travels have ended And taken you far And all your wishes are in your reach May you look back and wonder And know that your heart and your paddle Were true and deep Cone. Really? Yeah. Seriously? Mm -hmm. All right. The Is what? it on? Yeah. You know what I love about being outdoors? The what? We don't even need to brush our teeth. But when we do, we just pick up a pine cone. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs>